Hey, everybody. I'm back. Hopefully that break gave you a chance to take care of some, some things today. Um, before we jump into our next session, I do, again, want to thank everybody for joining us today. We definitely have the patient insights survey that you can click onto on the left side of the screen. We'll be sending the link separately as well. I definitely want to thank our industry partners, Asai and Pfizer, for definitely supporting the Virtual Patient Symposium, making it possible to bring this type of information to you guys. They do have links as well that you can click on to go and find some patient-friendly information uh, regarding their company and their products and how they support uh, kidney cancer. But we have a great talk coming up now. Um, Brittany Finley, who is a nutritionist that's going to talk a little bit about you know, the, the other concern that we have when you get a diagnosis of cancer is what nutrition is best? What can help, you know, make it through treatments, make me healthier, uh, maybe lower the risk of recurrence, or maybe even lower the risk of getting cancer itself. So she's going to offer us some great information and dispel some of the myths out there. So feel free to put your comments in the chat, but I'm going to turn it over to Brittany uh, and hear all about nutrition and cancer. Good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be with you here today and for us to talk about some basics of nutrition during treatment, after treatment, to try and prevent cancer. We're really going to go over some basics. So let's get started. Um, just about me, Brittany Finley. I am a board certified specialist in oncology nutrition as well as a dietitian. So what we're going to talk about today, we're really going to go over some myths because what happens once you're diagnosed with cancer is that everybody wants to help. They really do. And a lot of times this is when that misinformation about nutrition is spread. And, you know, there can be fear around food and it can just be really confusing, especially when we're trying to take care of ourselves and nourish ourselves. So we're going to bust some of those myths. Then we're going to go over some gentle nutrition guidelines for kidney cancer. <clears throat> so, with myths, we want to look out for red flags when it comes to people talking about nutrition in the first place. So some big red flags are if a form of eating or pattern eating acts, asks you to eliminate one food group or it makes food moral, makes food good or bad or like clean or dirty. Um, if the pattern of eating uses testimony instead of research, you always want to use evidence-based research. When it comes to nutrition, it is an actual science. Um, if it asks you to spend lots of money on special foods or supplements that aren't regulated by the FDA, which most supplements are, it can be pretty problem problematic. Um, again, if it recommends supplements instead of real food, if it promises a quick fix, and if it sounds too big, good to be true, it's probably too big to be true. Um, so just be on the lookout for those red flags, okay? <clears throat> so our first fact versus fiction, and I want you to give you the answer to yourself first. So fact or fiction, one food or food group can cause or cure cancer. Fiction, although some foods do affect cancer risk, there is no evidence that one specific food can cause or cure your cancer. So once it comes to nutrition, it's really about your overall pattern of eating, okay? So one hot dog is not going to cause cancer or eating one blue, a little bit of blueberries every day is not necessarily gonna cure cancer. But what we wanna do is try and add more of the foods that are on the left, like those fruits, vegetables, whole grains, because those foods we know have chemicals that help our cells try and fight off cancer, like um, anti-inflammatory foods, um, phytochemicals. So trying to get more of those in your diet. So what can you add to your diet to prevent cancer or reoccurrence? So how can I add these things? And also realizing that there are some foods that are linked to higher cancer risk, like hot dogs, red meats, alcohol. So trying not to have those all the time, really trying to have them in moderation. And if you can avoid them, or if you want to avoid them, that's okay as well. <clears throat> so a lot of times with my patients, I'll have them come to me and they'll will have been told that, you know what, I, you should go on a detox because chemo can be toxic, quote unquote. The truth is, 
that detox diets are not healthy. The body is fully capable of removing toxins, okay? So um, our lungs do it, our kidneys, our liver, they all help to remove toxins. Now you can support your body in removing toxins by ensuring that you're getting adequate water, making sure that you're getting adequate nutrients from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and making sure that you're getting some movement in. So sweat is the way to help get quote unquote toxins out. There is no strong evidence that fasting or specific diets improve this, pro this process, okay? They have done research. It just, it does, the evidence doesn't support it. The other thing to think about is, is that with many of these diets or like these detox teas, they can have severe side effects. Um, so they may cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, and that can be really problematic, if, especially if you're in treatment when you're already having those side effects. And what happens is you're missing out on those critical nutrients from food to help you feel well and recover. So I would stay away from these quote unquote detox diets. So this is probably the biggest one on the internet right now. Um, sugar feeds cancer. What do you guys think? Give you a second. It is true that sugar does technically feed cancer, but I need to put a huge caveat on this, okay? All cells, including cancer cells, use glucose or sugar for energy. And they also use fat and they also use protein. Now, once it comes to your regular cells or cancer cells, they prefer sugar or glucose. The thing is, is that taking those away doesn't make the cancer stop growing. And it doesn't prevent cancer by taking the sugar away. And the other problem thing is that a lot of times if we tell ourselves we can't have something, what happens? We want that. That's all we can think about. So if I tell you right now, you can't have an Oreo. I don't want you to think about an Oreo. Oreos are terrible, terrible for you. I can pretty much guarantee that all of you are probably thinking about an Oreo, right? So restricting things like sugar can lead to binge, okay? So it's kind of counterproductive. As far as a guideline when it comes to sugar, it is good to try and pay attention to how much sugar you're in, intaking. So maybe having the non-sugar version of a beverage, um, maybe keeping a treat to once or twice a, a day, um, but trying and not to make the food moral like we talked about in the beginning, okay? So sugar is not bad. It's just sugar. You want to pay attention to it, but you don't want to obsess it. Okay, and remember that, yes, technically it does feed cancer cells, but it feeds every cell in your body and taking it away doesn't prevent that from happening. It doesn't slow the um, cancer growth or it doesn't prevent cancer growth, okay? <clears throat> so fact or fiction, should weight loss be the focus, okay? A lot of times people will come to me and say, you know, the silver lining of this is, oh, at least I'll lose weight or, you know, that's the one benefit. Well, fiction. We don't want weight loss to be your primary goal, especially during active treatment, whether it be surgery, whether it be radiation or um, chemotherapy. During treatment, weight loss as little as 6% is associated with reduced response to treatment, reduced survival, and reduced quality of life, okay? The second part of that is I want to kind of have a little bit of a switch here in the way that we think, okay? So a lot of times we think of weight as a behavior, as something that is fully controllable and an action. But once you pause and think for a second, weight is not a behavior. Behaviors are behaviors. So for example, me getting physical activity for 30 minutes every day, that's an actual behavior. Do I do it or do I not? Do it? Or me adding beans to my plate every day to increase fiber, that's an actual behavior. Weight itself and what the scale says is not a behavior, okay? So trying to shift your focus to things like movement, um, increasing, increasing nutrient-dense foods for your cells that they enjoy, getting adequate hydration, 
managing your stress, which can be really hard to do, but that's a huge part of this, okay? So focusing on the behaviors, not just the number on the skin. <clears throat> Okay, fact or fiction, there is one perfect diet for those experiencing kidney cancer. Um, no, definitely not. So there's no one perfect pattern of eating for anyone, okay? Whether you have cancer or not, um, there's no one perfect anti-cancer diet. There's no one perfect anti-reoccurrence of cancer diet. Now, there are some general things that help, like getting adequate movement, increasing fruits and vegetables, <clears throat> reducing, you know, red meat intake to maybe once a week or twice a week. Um, each person is different, okay? We all have different genetics and we all have different needs. So once it comes to nutrition, especially with kidney cancer, it's really best to work with a dietitian because we will combine what your labs look like your needs, and your preferences. Because a lot of times people consider, okay, we need to eat for our labs and eat for nutrition, but you still want to get other things out of food, like enjoyment, like that's okay. Other things you get from food or sense of community. You know, when was the last time you went and ate with family? So when you are setting up your diet pattern, you want to take all of those things into consideration. We want to include those nutrient dense foods. We want to add variety. So maybe this week you have apples and pears. Next week you have pumpkins and grapes. So trying to add that variety in because the different colors are giving you different nutrients to yourselves. Okay. The other thing to consider are, like I said, foods you enjoy, as well as the social component. And then also food security. So it was really amazing watching that, the last talk about financial toxicity. And one thing that I've seen sometimes is that people are told by well-meaning um, caregivers that they have to eat perfect, or they have to follow this kale diet, or they have to follow this keto diet. And they may not be able to afford it. They may not have access to those certain types of food. So once it comes to your meal pattern, I still want you to include foods that you enjoy, foods that are nutrient dense, and foods that you can afford. You don't have to go buy the most expensive protein supplement to help you get through this. We can figure out, you know, maybe milk with a little bit of extra protein can help, or it really depends on the person, okay? So all of that needs to be taken into consideration once it comes to your diet. Okay, and remember, there's no one perfect weight. <clears throat> so I teach from a perspective of intuitive eating. Um, and one of the principles of intuitive eating after we've gotten rid of things like diet culture, which some of the things that I've talked about, like you have to follow a certain diet, our diet, but we teach something called gentle nutrition. So gentle nutrition is combining our nutrition knowledge knowing that we need fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and certain nutrients to support ourselves, along with what our body needs, wants, and, you know, combining the two. That's what gentle nutrition is. So instead of shooting yourself and telling you you have to do certain things, it gives you a little bit of permission to not be at war with food and try and trust your body, okay? So gentle nutrition can look like eating more fruits and vegetables, eating more whole grains because we know that they have more fiber in them, eating the fruits and vegetables, like I said, because we know that they have more nutrients in them to help prevent recurrence of cancer. Um, it may look like adding foods for taste and satisfaction. So maybe you make yourself a yogurt bowl and you add your fruit and vegetable, I mean, excuse me, your fruit to it, like your strawberries, but you're like, you know what, this is missing something. I'm really craving something. I want chocolate. That's giving yourself permission to give, put a few chocolate chips in there. Okay, so still enjoying that food and making it satisfying. The other thing is really playing around with portion sizes, okay? So a lot of times when people are on active treatment, 
you don't have appetite for a few days, right? So you may not eat a ton of food. But that third day, people will tell me, Brittany, I'm craving nothing but potatoes, cake, chips, waffles. And there's a reason for that. For three days, you didn't get a lot of nutrients to, post to support your cells or a lot of calories or a lot of in energy to support your cells. So now your body is telling you, hey, I need calorically dense food to help me recover for the next few days. So trusting yourself, right? Um, so playing around with those pulse sites. Now, say you're completely done with treatment and you're just um, trying to move, maybe prevent reoccurrence and take care of yourself in the best way. Maybe if you eat something like pizza, like if you have four slices, taking a few seconds or a few seconds to a few a minute and say, okay, how do I feel about this? I'm not feeling so great. Maybe four slices is not what's best for me. Maybe I could have had two and had a salad. So trying to kind of see how you're feeling after you eat, okay? And probably my favorite part of digital nutrition is making meal planning easy right? So once it comes to meal planning, I try to think of having three things on my plate every time I eat, okay? So that's the three macronutrients, a carb, a protein, a fat. Or another way to think of it is trying to have a carb, so a starch, a fruit or vegetable, and a protein source, okay? So that could be something as simple as having cheese, crackers, and grapes, um, that could be something as simple as having a peanut butter jelly sandwich with an apple. It could be also something as simple as having chicken, a half a cup of rice, and an asparagus. And those could be frozen meals. So that's kind of the first step is making those baby steps. Is there a protein for my cells? Is there carb or fiber for my cells? Is there fruit or vegetable for my cells to give me the most bang for my buck? Okay. <clears throat> excuse me so eating a healthy balanced diet is super important for some, anyone living with kidney cancers again your nutritional needs will depend on what type of treatment you're on and the stage of your cancer but some general guidelines for anybody who's experienced kidney cancer or is going through it or has been through it especially during treatment it's pretty much better to go with more small frequent meals um, just because eating that small amount helps you tolerate food a little bit better, okay? Um, I know a lot of my patients, if, you know, I'm from the South and we love on each other by giving people food, right? So if I was to give one of my patients a plate that's got chicken, mac and cheese, mashed potatoes, and it's piled high, they may look at this and go, no, I'm good, and lose their appetite completely. So going for those more small kind of meals, like that cheese crackers grapes, right? Um, trying to include more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and lean free protein in your diet. Also trying to include plant-based protein sources. So I want to have a little caveat here. You do not have to be vegan or vegetarian to have a more plant-based diet. Having a more plant-based diet is including more fruits, vegetables, and lean proteins like um, beans or plant-based proteins like beans, soy, um, legumes, okay, trying to include more of those. You don't have to be vegan or vegetarian. If that is something you're interested in, it is completely doable, but you don't have to. The other thing with kidney cancer is if we have other kind of outlying factors, like if we have diabetes or if we have high blood pressure, we want to manage those through gentle nutrition. So maybe reducing your salt intake, okay? So maybe not adding salt with your cooking. Maybe getting, once you're looking at the label, try and find anything when this, where it has the sodium, looking for a label that says less than 400 grams of, milligrams of sodium per serve, okay? So that's one huge thing. So trying to reduce the salt intake and trying to increase those other nutrients like magnesium, um, and depending on your labs, things like potassium. So you get those from fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, right? And then the other thing with gentle nutrition for kidney cancer is if you have a fluid restriction, make sure that you're working with your doctor or dietitian on that fluid restriction, okay? <clears throat> okay. 
And then the last couple slides, these are just some examples of frames to use when it comes to meal plan, okay? So this first one is then from the American Institute of Cancer Research. This is the new American plate. So trying to have one third or less of animal protein, a half of vegetables, half a plate of vegetables, and then one third of a starch, right? Especially if you may be trying to make half of a whole grain, okay? Um, so again, that could be something as simple as lean pork with quinoa and broccoli. And to make it even easier on yourself, if you're not having the most energy when it comes to cooking, it can be frozen quinoa, I mean, frozen broccoli and microwaveable quinoa. So I don't want you to overthink food, okay? And then another framework that I really like to work with patients with is the DASH diet. This is used to help manage um, diabetes as well as high blood pressure. So typically a, a good option for people with any kind of kidney disease or kidney cancer, okay? So these are just part of the framework, but it really boils down to every time you eat, trying to have a protein source, a fruit or vegetable, and a starch. And then with this, this is with your GFR, your protein needs. I know a lot of times people ask me about protein needs specifically with kidney cancer. It really depends on your GFR, okay? So we do a calculation. Um, if your GFR is a four or above, excuse me, a three or above, we use your weight. So we use 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 grams of protein per kilogram, okay? So it really depends on the person, but a good kind of goal if your GFR is at a stage three or higher is trying to go between around 60 grams of protein. Okay, that's a general. Um, it can be a little bit different once you're on active treatment. So I would specifically ask a dietitian if you're going through treatment and using your GFR, what your proteins are. Okay. And then the last thing, big things to remember are that foods are morally equal. So foods are not nutritionally equal. So an apple pie and an apple are not nutritionally the same but they are morally. You are not bad because you choose to eat apple pie. And I just want you to remember that because as soon as you start thinking of food as good or bad, it starts the stress response in your brain. Your vagus nerve starts going off, right? It makes it a harder to digest your food. It makes your blood sugars increase. You know, it can be problematic. So try to learn that those foods are morally equal and it's okay to eat both. Now, because I know I have this nutrition knowledge, maybe more than half the time I want to use that apple, but it's still okay to eat that apple, okay? Try and tune into how your body is feeling after and during meals, meals and snacks and before. So get curious and experiment. So if you're stressed out, maybe you notice, you know what, I didn't digest my food that well. Or you know what, I had a lot of carb in that one meal and now I'm feeling kind of tired. You are the expert of your body. Okay, I may be a nutrition expert, but you know how about that food kind of interacts with your body, right? So you got to work together, okay? Um, there's no perfect anti-cancer diet, and choices should be based off your individual needs, perfect personal preferences, and your labs, okay? And flexibility with eating along with compassion with, for your body can help you find balance in your choices, okay? So I know we covered a lot in a short amount of time. But I know Sally said there were some questions, so I would love to take some questions right now. All right, thanks, Brittany. That was definitely great. Um, yeah, we do have some questions in there. Um, first one, can you really address um, maybe some foods that could help with some of the side effects, something like diarrhea, which is a common sort of side effect for some of the kidney cancer medications? For sure, okay, so a couple things. So first thing is, once you have diarrhea, I want you to make sure that you are getting yourself hydrated. And so water's great, but you might need something like Pedialyte or Pediatric, okay? As far as foods, you want those soluble fibers. So things like bananas, maybe plums, um, maybe once you're choosing things you want to go for more bland things like white toast, grits, um, those are all good options. 
And the other thing I would include are probiotic foods like yogurt. Okay, so that can really help a lot. Um, so maybe Activia, that can really help what you're struggling with um, diarrhea. And then also getting that soluble fiber, but also maybe using something like Met Metamucil to, to kind of bulk it up a little bit. Okay, um, that's definitely a common side effect that we deal with. When it comes to things like GFR or just in general, um, general health, is there any particular protein that's better? Is it, let's say, a plant over, you know, a, an animal protein? Is it pork over red and chicken? What's, what's sort of the better protein choices? So the most, so this is where I can get a little confusing, because the one that your body absorbs the quickest would be animal proteins, right? So if you're on active treatment, maybe choosing a leaner animal source protein like chicken or lean pork, right? But I would also include those plant-based proteins um, because they are good options for you. They're pretty, they're pretty even once just more biologically available, meaning that it's not as hard to process, okay? So if your GFR is low, go for more of the plant-based protein. If you're in that middle area, you can kind of go for a mixture. Okay. Yeah. And when you have um, renal cell carcinoma and your kidneys are affected, does it lower the ability of your body to remove the toxins? Is there something additional you need to do? There's nothing additional you need to do other than I would make sure that you're hydrated and that you're adequately, adequately nourished. Um, it doesn't really change much. They've done studies and there's not much that helps to get extra toxins out. And then also at mood, so things like sweating, you know, exercise, that that can help to move things around. Um, Great. And I think the one last question is you, you spoke about this at the very beginning of the presentation, and it was definitely commented on throughout. You know, we, we all hear that there's no special food, there's nothing that one key diet. Sometimes, you know, you mentioned hot dogs, which it's not necessarily the hot dog is bad, but things that in the hot dog aren't necessarily as nutritious. And therefore, it's not just the hot dog. It's maybe some of the chemicals in the hot dog itself. But what is moderation? What's a good sort of rule of thumb for somebody to say, hey, I need to moderate my alcohol intake, or I need to moderate my red meat intake. What does moderation mean? So moderation can be tricky because we can really tell ourselves we can't have something really restricted and we end up in denied, right? So the first thing is to realize it's more, it's morally equal, okay? But maybe give yourself some guidelines. So once it comes to things like red meat and hot dogs and those types of things, which is considered a red meat, you say, okay, I don't want to have more than 10 ounces of this a week. So that would be two servings, right? Okay, with alcohol, we know the, the, the version of moderation based off studies. So for alcohol, that would be um, one drink a day for women. Not saying that you have to do this, but this is what moderation is. And one drink is either one shot, uh, eight ounce beer or a five ounce glass of wine, right? And for men, that's two drinks per day. Now, that doesn't mean that if I don't drink Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I get to have all of that in one day. No, okay. So the studies show that that's what moderation is for um, alcohol and kind of red meat. So another way to think of it is like the 80-20 rule or even the 70-30 rule, 70% 70 of the time, I'm trying to make sure that I have that protein, that fruit or vegetable, that whole grain. And then maybe that 20% of the time, I'm having those fun foods or those foods that I enjoy. And I think it's also, you know, you need to take a look at what you know your regular diet is. One of the first things, as you mentioned, you can do is take a look at the serving size. You'll be surprised that they're not as big as we think they are. Um, so that's the first thing you could use to cut down. And then again, some people may eat red meat every single day of the week. So moderation for them might be cutting down even just at one step to three to four a week versus every single night for dinner. And so you really need to take that history of yourself into account and it's also hard when you have a whole family. I know I came from a family with very high heart disease and we didn't all want to be on that heart disease diet. Um, and we complained. And as kids, we threw a fit. Um, so it's sometimes hard. You don't want to have to make three different meals either. So definitely you, you got to work with that family, got to work with what you're used to. But the biggest take home for me, Brittany, was when you said they're all morally equal. You're not bad if you slip up. You're not bad if you're not getting in that perfect plate with every meal. Cut yourself a break. You're dealing with cancer. Um, you've got big things out there. 
There's no one thing that if you miss it or you eat a certain meal, it's going to increase your risk and send you down a horrible path. You're allowed to have, you know, those, those morally, those apple pie ice cream moments. You can have those. Um, but yeah, so thank you so much. You, we have your con connecting information up there on the screen for everybody. We'll definitely make sure that that's available. Um, we have a uh, our patient navigator, again, if you need to know how to connect for, with other nutritional resources, make sure to get in touch with the KCA on that. But we'll move on to our next presentation. So thanks so much, Brittany. Thank you, guys.